For many years, I have wondered what it would be like to play Terraria, but it's a horror game. Now, I don't really like horror as a genre, whether video games or movies, but having it in Terraria just sounds fun. Well, now that we're in the season of Spook, I figured I'd spend a month in the Spooky mod, which has its whole theme based around the spooky, but not necessarily scary things. <laughs> Let's see just how terrifying this mod can be. <laughs> When I started, I didn't find myself in the classic Terraria forest, but instead in this autumn looking biome with old trees. And that's not just because I think they look old, but because that's what this wood is literally called. I come across my first enemy, a putty slime, near this naturally generated house with a little orange thing in it who I missed, but we'll get to him later. A little further down and we reach regular forest and because there was already one modded biome at the start, I figured I'd keep on going to see if there was any more, but then got sidetracked by a cave. Upon returning home, I made a base with the old wood since it looks pretty cool, and I should also say now that I love that you spawn inside of a modded biome. Giving the player immediate access to such a wealth of new content I think is a great idea for any mod to get people interested in playing rather than having to wait a while and search around before finding anything new. And so let's see what more spooky stuff the starting area gives us. After all, there's a pit right next to spawn, so I jumped down to find out what else might be available. The caves look pretty cool, and I stumbled upon this locked chest. It makes me curious, but I'm also infuriated that I need a key so early in the game. Well, what you gonna do now? <laughs> if the chests are locked, maybe there's something I can craft, and sure enough, there is. I found a recipe for this modded item called the Cowbell. It's a pretty simple recipe, and it gives me a summon, which is super cool, so let's use it. What? <laughs> you guys, why did you lie to me? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Leave, leave, I can't, I can't escape. Kill me, please. Let me perish. No, no. <laughs> No! Run into it! Why is it counting down? Why is it counting down? Oh! That's why I don't play horror games. I was so lightheaded, and after this, I probably would have fainted from lightheadedness if it had been worse than that. But moving on, I made old wood armor, which doesn't do anything special. It's just kind of like a spooky looking. I continued to explore for a while, gathering the basic materials I need before we can really get going. But the whole time I'm wondering, are there any more of those terrifying, grinning monstrosities out in the world? I can no longer trust any of the modded weapons, but at the same time, I have to use them because what else am I going to do? Only use vanilla weapons? I'm not sure my heart can take another one of those things though. On the bright side, the normal enemies I run into aren't nearly as terrifying, and one of my favorites so far is this mage looking guy. But it's time to get back to the little house I passed by before. Turns out the orange thing that was there is actually an NPC who more or less tells me to jump down the ditch, which I've already explored. The creators say he's basically the mod's version of the guide, but after talking to him a few times in pre-hard mode, I stopped because I always got the same message or two messages even after beating bosses, it didn't seem all that helpful. The next step in our terrifying journey is to head to the jungle. Apparently there is a modded biome in or near it, and of course this means there's potentially another living incarnation of my every nightmare. On the other side of the jungle, I found this darker wooded graveyard of a biome which looks really cool. All the sprites thus far have such a strong contrast and are very detailed, which is pretty cool and I think feeds into the spookiness. But the most interesting thing I found in this biome were a bunch of treasure chests, which had some pretty helpful loot. But before I could explore the entire space, I spotted this goofy little red guy who looks like a passive mob. Me to go fishing. He's not a passive mob. <laughs> well, that sucks. But before we return, I thought it'd be smart to keep collecting better gear since wood armor isn't exactly the best. This is also the run where I discovered using a Spelunker potion early in progression is actually really nice. I almost always hoard these things until hard mode ores are spawned in and also use them for Chlorophyte, but 
this has opened my eyes to using spelunkers much earlier in progression. You just have to make sure you have some simple farm set up to craft more spelunker potions in the future. I also decided to search the right side of the world real quick to see if there were any more modded biomes, but while I was doing that, the Eye Cthulhu decided to spawn, and an evil presence watching me just feels appropriate considering this is spooky Terraria. I did decide to fight the Eye despite not having the best gear and no arena to speak of, but then I discovered I could just use the nurse and absolutely cheese the final phase like I had no business to. Huh. Guess I've learned a new strategy if I need to blast through the game. <laughs> I destroyed a few Crimson Hearts in the hopes of getting the Goblin Army to spawn so I can also get the Goblin Tinkerer and then also grab a gun. And at last, we make a return to the graveyard biome where I encounter this temple-looking place with a glowing altar. What could this altar mean? What does it do? I wasn't sure, so I went deeper into the temple until I hit these yellow unbreakable blocks. I tried getting around them but was unable to, so I presume I'll have to do something with the glowing shrine above me, and after hovering my mouse over it, this, well, kind of mouse looking thing appears and I remembered seeing this in the mods crafting recipes. So after crafting it, I headed back on over, made a basic arena because, you know, it kind of feels like a boss thing, so let's prepare and I used the item on the shrine. This quick animation played and the spooky spirit boss spawned. I was woefully unprepared for this fight, but he looks pretty cool and I was able to hold out for long enough to learn some of the attacks. So despite dying, I have a much better idea as to how to deal with him next week. With the second week, I know we had to take down that phantom boss. So I built some jungle housing in preparation for a jungle pylon, but also put down a bed for the time being. But before I dare take on the Phantom again, I'm going to the jungle to find a Cloud in a Bottle and Hermes Boots since I haven't had any luck finding those yet. Plus finding a Boomstick would be really nice, but I didn't end up finding that because it took no time at all to find Hermes Boots and a Cloud in a Bottle, which is just great. I searched all these other caves, they weren't there, but the jungle just had them readily available, that's, that's lovely. So I added a second layer to the arena and summoned the Spooky Spirit again. This time I did quite a bit better, but I was relegated to only using the Tendon Bow. It's a fine weapon and all, but wasn't able to hit the Phantom consistently enough, nor do quite enough damage for the fight to not drag on for a very long time, and I just couldn't last. So I lost that fight, but at least was able to practice and learn the boss's patterns a bit better. Here's to hoping the second phase doesn't mix things up too much. When I get home, someone said I should mine the pumpkins around spawn. I had broken a few at the start and nothing happened, so I left them around since they looked cool, but after mining two more, I got two rotten seeds that looked suspiciously like a boss summon, and sure enough, they are. Say hello to the Rot Gourd, the ground pound boss. I'm definitely overgeared for this fight, and based on patterns alone, I'm pretty sure this guy would be around Aya Cthulhu or something like that. All he really does is stomp around a lot, so simply running is enough to dodge most of his attacks. There are two projectile attacks he has, one that's shot from the sky down, and one that shoots floating kind of projectiles horizontally. The vertical one from the sky was just as easy to dodge as the ground pounds, but the floating projectiles were a bit tough, though another layer of platforms is likely all you'd need to avoid these. As I suspected, he dropped the key, the key I needed to unlock the treasure chest down in the hole near spawn, so of course, I got to work on unlocking them. This is when it was very much confirmed that this boss is either meant to be fought before or after Aya Cthulhu, as the chest loot weapons and accessories were all worse than what I already had, but it was cool to check them out and see what was inside. Before we take on the Phantom again, say hello to Spooky Dance Ghost. This guy may very well be my favorite part of the mod. Who decided to add this thing? <laughs> Though that actually reminds me that the passive mobs in Spooky Terraria are all pretty fun. Back to the Phantom boss, I was using a machine gun sort of weapon from the old wooden chest just to see if I liked it, and for a moment, I thought it was shredding the boss because its health disappeared almost immediately upon spawning, and it was only until a little after that I realized a star had actually hit the phantom almost the second it spawned? What are the odds of that? Let's talk about how this boss functions now. It has five different attacks that it rotates through in a consistent pattern. First, it dashes at you three times. Maybe less? I think it's always three. After the third dash, it shoots this projectile that has short range at first, but then they lock onto your location and dart towards you. But they aren't homing, they just lock onto where you were at any given moment and move there. 
It turns orange after this and shoots these projectiles in what I'll call a fan pattern, and they were both easy and difficult to dodge at the same time, and I can't really explain why. All I know is I found that moving as little as possible and keeping my feet planted was usually the best bet for dodging them. Once it's done with this, it'll rain down a shower of purple projectiles, and finally, it'll kind of spawn in projectiles at random places that move in random directions before dashing at you midway through. In second phase, it does something that Hollow Knight bosses do, oddly enough, which I actually quite enjoy, and that is, what a first phase, but faster. Now, these bosses aren't quite just faster. That isn't exactly what they do, but a little bit. A Moon Lord Beam is also added at the end of the orange attack, and these quasi-homing shots are fired right after the second one. But other than that, there aren't too many changes other than it felt a little bit faster. And I must say, I quite enjoy bosses that don't massively change the second phase, and also don't double the projectiles. There are a few more you need to keep in mind, but mostly second phase is just a little faster, and I really enjoy that. If you want to know my thoughts on Hollow Knight though, I played it for the first time recently and I'll be making a video on it over on the second channel Throbin Gaming where we talk about all kinds of other games. I also live streamed it on Kick and Twitch. With the boss down and plug out of the way, <laughs> let's see what this new dungeon has in store for us. And immediately I notice I am not allowed to break or place blocks. I don't know how I feel about this, but I think it is this way because you're supposed to sort of solve this dungeon. It's not quite a puzzle or maze, but it also is one at the same time. Or maybe I can't place blocks, so now I'm stuck in the dark and now it's more spooky. Uh, maybe that's why they did it. There are some enemies down here that are kind of cool, but they didn't feel as prevalent or dangerous as they did in the vanilla dungeon. I was a bit afraid the chest down here would be locked just like the ones back at spawn, but thankfully they were not. The first weapon I found was this scythe, and by killing enemies with it, I'd get this light spirit that float around me. After getting a certain number of these spirits, they're supposed to work as a homing projectile, but this one created so much light that I stopped using the scythe and kept it around as a light bet. It was very handy. There was a whip that doesn't do a lot of damage, but it's nine whips all at the same time, so at close range I could see this as being pretty good. But the weapon I really wanted to get to is the Old Hunter's Crossbow. Let's use Skeletron to illustrate why I love this weapon and why it's broken as all get out. At first, I fought the floating skeleton with my blade of grass and tendon bow because the Hunter's Crossbow says charging it does more damage and charging it takes a hot second. So I didn't think it was great. But then I thought to myself, what if I just spam click instead of charging the arrows? Well, I don't think I need to say anything here. You can just see how this weapon absolutely shreds Skeletron. Plus, this crossbow has a really high crit chance, so that on top of its already solid damage output made me redo my entire strategy centered around this crossbow. Week 3 and... Guess what? No, not chicken butt. The mod has undergone a major update and the creators reached out to ask me to create a new world because apparently even some of the world gen has changed. But of course, we are already about halfway through the month, so I used cheat sheet to get some houses and basic supplies. At least my character can transfer over. But the first thing I had to do was test the crossbow because I had been told it was nerfed and it was indeed nerfed and nerfed hard. I had just altered my entire strategy to be centered around this thing and now it's maybe half as strong as before. It's not useless by any means, but it's not absurdly broken like it was before. Dang it! With the houses down, the first thing I'm going to do is make a beeline to the underworld. That's where we left off in progression, but there is also supposed to be a new biome somewhere down there. Along the way, I tested the crossbow a little and also discovered the scythe's light thingies no longer glow like they used to. Of all things to nerf, I hadn't expected them to do that. Dang it, that sucks. <laughs> I get it, I get it, but that sucks. I didn't quite make it to the underworld biome, so I figured I'd check out the graveyard biome near the dungeon where I came across the spookiest thing yet. Broken world gen. <laughs> the little temple that's supposed to let you spawn the phantom was missing. And there was this weird tower that went all the way to the Sky Highlands. Well, guess I can't fight the Phantom now, and that also means I can't break the yellow blocks that let me into the dungeon. And there is actually another layer or two to the dungeon that unlocked later in the game, so I have to get down there. 
This is why I keep cheat sheet active whenever I'm playing these mods because you never know when you'll run into situations like this where I literally can't spawn the boss I need without using it. And I also got the blessing from the creators, thank you. So I spawned him in and auto killed him just to open up the dungeon before returning to my hunt for the underworld biome and sure enough, here it is, the Valley of Eyes. Gotta say, I think this is the spookiest biome yet, just because everything is fleshy and eye-themed and it's just off-putting. And enemies like the giant tumor don't help with that at all. There is an NPC down here though, and I'm pretty sure you can't move him anywhere else. I think he's always going to be here. This guy gives you quests, which just amount to you collecting certain items, and if you do that, then he'll give you some type of flask. At first, I was a bit confused because he told me the ingredients to make the flask and I figured I gave him the ingredients for the quest, but instead, the witch's pot here let me craft the flask and then I'm supposed to submit the flask to him for the quest, at which point he gives me stuff. One of those things he gave me was this meat that I then fed to a treasure chest to loot its contents. I could also mine the chest after this, so I can't help but assume I poisoned the thing. <laughs> The next boss on our list is down here as well, and he is the Flying Nose Boss, Moko, 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 M-O-C, Mock Flying Nose, whom you summon by sticking a cotton swab up this nose statue's nostril. Yes, you heard me right. This mod gets goofy sometimes. The boss was about as simple as the Phantom and is in many ways similar to it, so we won't talk too much about it here, but how could I not mention Flying Nose Monster? I must admit though, he's harder to beat than you might think because he moves fast and he's a small target, but this petulant nostril is very important because he drops the sentient heart. And after losing a fight to the Wall of Fresh, I brought this heart to the NPC down here, and he was able to combine the Imp Staff with the heart to get a new summon, Grug the Gargoyle, who is genuinely strong enough to use up to Plantera. Now you can only get one sentient heart from the nose, but you get more later in the game, and these hearts combine with vanilla weapons to create, well, kind of OP weapons, and I love it. I managed to take the victory in the next fight against the Wall of Fresh, and I'm happy to report I primarily used the crossbow in this battle, so it's very much still a viable weapon. But now we're in hard mode, which means we can get to the next boss, the Daffodil, who's in a layer of the dungeon that unlocked once I entered hard mode. So after I got Adam inside armor, I crafted the summon, which is a brick that you chuck at its head. And now let's just talk about this boyo here because I fought him so many times that we'll get a bit into week four here. When you wake him up, there'll be this text that appears since I guess this guy speaks. When he's done, he'll try to get a cheap shot in on you and will follow it up with these homing projectiles that shoot out and then come back in. I found it best to wait for them to come in before jumping and then dashing to one direction. Next are the spiky balls that never go to the same place, but hiding beneath these platforms is a pretty good bet. These balls will freeze at some point and after a second explode into sharp thorns, so I always avoided standing next to them. Now there's flies that come from both directions horizontally and then green things that fall vertically. Immediately upon the vertical one's ending is by far the most annoying attack, which is these thorns coming from the ground. Nothing indicates where they're going or where they're going to come from, and there's so little room you hardly have a chance to dodge. Maybe there's a key to this, but I haven't figured it out. I only dodged them when luck was on my side. When those go away, you are shot at by a Moonlord laser, but it's pretty well telegraphed. You just have to get used to seeing this thing as a telegraph and not a projectile. In second phase, he removes the walls and floors from you, making the arena even smaller, but other than shooting several more Moonlord lasers, the battle isn't all that different. The second four Moonlord lasers were a little annoying though. I can't quite figure out the best way to avoid them, especially since one time I jumped into the lasers but took no damage and thought that maybe only the end of the laser does damage, but then I died every other time, so the hitbox for these things wasn't totally consistent. When you finally take him down, he doesn't actually explode and actually just tosses you the loot while staying exactly where he is, which is pretty neat. Now over half the fights with the Daffodil were in this week, but I didn't want to break them up, so here we are now with the newly unlocked portion of the dungeon. It's not a whole lot different than the earlier sections, but there is new loot, including the summon, that you can change between three classes. So the summon can take the form of a soldier, a mage, or a ranger, and I love the variety it offers. 
I also found the baby rattle from a mob drop, and now this thing won't go away. I was really confused for a bit, but after I hovered my mouse over it, I discovered this is another one of those spooky things, like the smiling black one from before, only this one wasn't really frightening at all. I was just really confused. He also wouldn't go away, so I was stuck in pitch black for a solid minute or so. He also didn't kill me, and turns out that these things won't kill you anymore with the latest update, and that actually makes me kind of sad that they made that change, but at the same time, I know I would have been mildly annoyed if I had been killed while exploring the dungeon because I tried to use a weapon. <laughs> the most interesting part of this new portion of the dungeon was that I found Pandora's box just lying around, so what else would I do other than open it, only to get attacked by a bunch of spirits. I feel like not a lot of mods add events like this, maybe I'm wrong about that, but this one is a really low-key one instead of being some big thing, so that was nice. That and the summon were the only things I found interesting other than the old hunter's rifle, which is actually one of my favorite weapons now. I used it primarily against the twins, and also for a while wandering around, and though this isn't perhaps the best weapon in the world, it is definitely strong enough to be a viable option while also being super satisfying to use. This is what a sniper rifle should feel like. I did take down all three mechs without losing once, which has got to be a first for me. <laughs> maybe my skill issue is going away. My hardcore run may be the only other time I've managed to do this, and I prepared a lot more for those than this one. But now that they're down, I can craft the acid concoction, which allows me to spawn the next modded event. I just have to get to the egg in the eye valley, and now there's another cool event where I use the huntsman's rifle, old, hun old hunter's rifle, <laughs> quite a bit. Not sure what to say about the event other than it felt difficult while also not being harder than it needed to be. I liked it, but hardly anything dropped from it. What the heck? All that work for nothing? I was genuinely confused and started wandering around to see if I'd missed anything. At some point, I clicked on the egg again to see what would happen, only for the next boss, Oron Boro, to suddenly burst out and attack me. Oh! Oh! <laughs> now this worm, this worm. I don't even know what to say about him. He was tough. I think I fought him nine times and only won once. I can't even hardly share with you what his pattern was because I'm not entirely sure I know it even after looking at the footage. Part of the problem I think is that he dashes off into the blocks above and below you a lot of the time so you can't even see him and then he'll shoot projectiles while you can't see him so they seemingly just come out of nowhere. Worse yet, his color scheme and the color of the projectiles are very similar to the biome, and so I actually found it hard to see the projectiles a lot of the time. Halfway through the fight, the worm breaks into two parts, and each part has different attacks, but like the first half, each segment moves pretty quick and camouflages into the biome. There are plenty of attacks where it straight up tells you where it's going to be, but at the same time, I found the boss rather tough. But I must say, I also didn't have much in the way of piercing weapons outside of the dart gun with crystal darts, and that's not the best with piercing. It does do it, but not the best. So maybe changing my loadout could have fixed the problem. He also dropped another mutant heart, which combined with the Gatling Gator of all things, creates the Gator Gun. It's not necessarily the most special weapon out there, but I just love Gator Gun, and sometimes that's all you need in life. It's the final week and there isn't a whole lot left to do other than take down one more modded boss, but before I can do that, I first have to take down Plantera and Golem. So I headed down to the jungle under the theory that it should be easy to find a bolt. After all, I have spent a good chunk of time enjoying the modded content in the Valley of Eyes after having beaten the mechs, which is something I love, by the way. Having content between the mechs and Plantera is so nice, because that way you're not roaming around the jungle endlessly in the hopes of finding the life fruit or the bulb or else sleeping in a bed to better your odds. Instead, I'm doing what I want, enjoying the content. The only problem with this theory, though, is that there wasn't a bulb anywhere in sight. It took just about 10 minutes before I finally found one, and I got to work on making an arena. Only problem is, the jungle temple is right next door, and there's a massive pool of lava above the bulb and I'd like to remove it. But, you know, I don't think lava destroys plantar bulbs, does it? Well, time for a science experiment. All right, science experiment time. Does lava burn a bulb? It does. Well, what do you know?
Oh, yeah, I should have thought that through a bit better. <laughs> and now I have to go searching for another bulb. My goodness, how do people play on small worlds? I made this one small because I had to make a new one due to the update and a small one would make it a lot easier to get around. And then I also played on a small world for the tether mod video and it sucks in both situations. I swear it's far more difficult finding life fruit and plant terra bulbs in small worlds and probably plenty of other things are harder too. I did find another bulb eventually and made sure I had a proper arena ready for it. I was also determined to use the gator gun and even got high velocity bullets for it because they pierce and I figured that'd be good for the second form. The weapon was alright for the first form, but nothing special and then in second form it did about what I'd expect it to do, and that is to say it did really well. <laughs> it's one of the short list of weapons I think handles the little hungries effectively. Into the Golem Arena, where I didn't exactly have a strategy other than the one I just used on Plantera, but I have to take this guy down since the summon for the modded boss uses Beetle Husks, well, in order to craft it, that is. I lost a few times while using the Gator Gun, but it's so inaccurate that I wondered if there was a better weapon, and that's when I remembered the old Hunter's Rifle. For some reason, I had already counted it as no longer a viable weapon to use, but it actually does a very good job at tearing apart the second form of Golem. I found it struggled more when there were multiple targets, but this is a sniper rifle after all, and it does great against single targets. Now let's get to the final boss of the mod, and this guy is legitimately one of the hardest bosses I've fought, who also feels fair. I would describe most bullet hell bosses as unfair because it's just a bunch of bullets all over the place, or maybe it's just uninteresting. I'm honestly not quite sure where I draw the line, since even bullet hell bosses have patterns you can detect and all that. And this final boss, the Big Bone, I actually felt had a few attacks that I thought weren't well telegraphed at all. Huh. Now I'm getting lost in the weeds a bit. Needless to say, this guy is very tough, but I think I still like him. Maybe? How do I feel about this guy? <laughs> he also killed me in 5 seconds after summoning him the first time. One thing to know about the Big Bone is that he has a bunch of different attacks, but no actual pattern. The attacks he uses will always be the same attack, at least in each phase, but you never know which one he's going to use next. Only that it won't be the same as the last one. His most obviously telegraphed attack is these red vines, and after seeing them a time or two, you figure out that circling around them is all you have to do to avoid them. The one that by far gave me the hardest time though was a projectile fan attack, where it would shoot these things in a wave formation, and then they would bounce off the walls, which is really the only reason they were so deadly, because they bounced. He has one attack where he spawns a bunch of skulls that move around the head for a bit before shooting out in random directions. This one always had the potential of being very easy and also very hard to dodge, depending on where the skulls felt like going. He's got one that shoots these fireballs that can throw you for a loop since they keep on following you for longer than you would intuitively think they would. And they explode into fire like the guys in the dungeon with their fireballs, so you gotta look out for that because the fire sticks around. There's an attack where he shoots a bunch of embers on the ground, and sometimes running underneath them is helpful for dodging, but if he used this attack within the last two or so, then you can't run beneath him without taking a bunch of damage. He's got one that shoots flower petal things that do contact damage, and you have to destroy them. He will charge at you with his head, though I never got hit with it. It's pretty easy to dodge and well telegraphed. And he's got what I think is his most dangerous attack, which is just a barrage of these wavy red projectiles. All you have to do is circle around him to avoid this, but if anything gets in your way, or you hesitate for just a second, then the projectiles will really do some damage. And it was always the least telegraphed and fastest attacking, so I almost never saw it coming. Once you take out half the health, he gets a shield and you have to destroy these petals to take it down. In second form, most of the fight is the same, but now he's got this spread vine attack that's very well telegraphed and pretty easily dodged. The bouncing skulls now don't hit the wall, but rather go towards the wall and then home in on your location, which actually made them a whole lot easier to dodge. Instead of shooting three fireballs, he'll shoot one, which then explodes into many little fireballs, but they're not that big of a threat? They are a bit random though, so that can be a problem. And finally, the skulls he once shot randomly now actually target you, which made them a thousand times easier to dodge. Somehow, second form was a lot easier than first form. In the end, this boss was really tough, and you definitely want to go into it with all the stops. 
I think he's technically listed as a boss after Fishron, and he definitely earns his place in progression and title of one of the hardest modded bosses I've taken on. But I suppose that's still a short list, and maybe I'm being unfair to the other bosses since this is a new boss and I haven't really figured him out yet. But that's the spooky mod. Very, very spooky. <laughs> I would definitely recommend trying it out. It was made by a solid group of people, and the mod itself was a whole lot of fun. And the spooky season is still in full swing, so if you've been looking for a Halloween-themed Terraria, this is it.